So uh, we briefly touched in the last session about uh, uh, some of the rising markets in Asia, and we're going to really focus on Asia in this panel. Um, but we have a special treat in that Dr. Uli Zig uh, was the Swiss ambassador to North Korea in the 90s. And given how much North Korea is currently in the news, uh, the South Korean president will be meeting with Kim Jong-un this Friday. And we believe that United States President Trump will be meeting with the leader of North Korea sometime later next month. Um, so there's a lot of uh, interest and excitement about that. And Dr. Zik actually has uh, a collection of North Korean art or propaganda, depending on your perspective. And I wondered if you could give us like the elevator pitch of how you got into collecting. And uh, you were just showing me briefly that you actually had some art commissions. So I wonder if you could talk about what it's like to deal, uh, to try to procure art in North Korea. I don't expect uh, North Korean art, unlike the political North Korea, to move to center for conventions on art in the near future. Uh, I visited as a business person in the 80s, ambassador in the 90s, business person after 2000, until recently, and the art looks the same. There are two focuses. One is, of course, Korean traditional art, and one is socialist realism. And uh, I can assure you it's the most emotional variant of socialist realism as compared to Chinese or Soviet realism. Uh, the people so passionate, of course, propaganda. And uh, it's all commissioned work. There is no space for autonomous art in North Korea at the moment. Uh, while I could move freely in the underground, like the semi-underground of Chinese contemporary art, I couldn't identify uh, something like an underground in North Korea for art. And the works you refer to, these are works that show the leaders like Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, uh, and there is only a handful of painters, they must carry the title, painters of the people who are allowed to paint their faces. So you would have a big collective paint these big paintings, and then these few people would you know, finally mount these faces. It took me years of negotiation with the government to get some of these works because uh, outside Korea and even more in, in private hands, they do not exist, paintings of their leaders. But you can commission, anyone can commission paintings of socialist realism, uh, but they would show anything but the two leaders or the three leaders now. Um, they, the artists are organized in two uh, corporations. There is no existence really as a professional artist outside of them. And they do all these commissions. And uh, maybe to end with a little anecdote, once I was there negotiating about a very large, like 20 meter painting, which never materialized so far. It may be the last history painting because that is now replaced by photography, but in North Korea, uh, painting still can carry such weight as uh, represent history. Uh, I was in one of these two corporations and the chairman told me uh, behind this door, uh, we have assembled the 110 best artists of the country. Please go in there and uh, tell them what they should paint. You have brought the Chinese contemporary art to the world. Now you must bring the North Korean art to the world. But I will end here. Well, I'm sure some of those themes, thank you so much for talking about that. I think some of those themes might resonate when we talk about other markets in Asia, about underground markets and the extent to which politics plays a role. But I wonder if I could throw it to Lisa a little bit. You could just talk about kind of the general market, why Asia is so important to the art world now. Um, yes, I have um, some stats, and it's fascinating. And I'm speaking specifically about Sotheby's numbers, but I think our numbers are generally indicative of what's happening at the other auction houses and in the market in general galleries as well. But the global spend by Asian buyers in all categories at Sotheby's has increased 50% in the last five years. So if we take that and look at 2017, Asian clients accounted for 30 5% of Sotheby's global sales by values, which translates roughly into $1.6 billion. And um, last year, 
38% of all Asian spending in our auctions went to Western art, and that's up 29% from the previous year of 2016. When we speak about Asia, we speak about mainland China, Hong Kong, Korea, Taiwan, Japan, and Southeast Asia. And each of those markets is very different, obviously, in terms of what's happening locally and globally. So it's hard to put, kind of put them all in one basket because it's such a broad area, but it's an area we really are paying attention to. I wonder if all the panelists could jump in a little bit on sort of where are the uh, buyers coming from? Are they tending to be, we, we hear of these kind of big, huge sales, like Maezawa-san in Japan buying the Basquiat, there's some big sales in China, but is that representative that it's sort of these billionaire types or is it more uh, corporations? Are they mainly young and entrepreneurial, older money? Where is the money coming from in Asia? Maybe Aki, you could start? Um, I think Asia is different from, uh, you, you can say there are three Asias. One is, I think, hello? Can you hear me? Not yet. Okay, I'll give you. Hello? Yes. Uh, I think Asia can be divided into three. One is uh, mainland China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, the Chinese uh, world, and then Korea, and then Japan. Uh, Japan uh, is a very, th there are many buyers and sellers, but it's certainly different from the other part. I'll give you four statistics which will explain that. One is number of millionaires in Japan is 8% of the world, only second to the US. But when it comes to about $50 million, then it's really 2%. And when it comes to billionaires, it's less than billionaires in India. And the other is number of visitors to museums. There is no museums in top 20. The most visited museum is 2.2 million, and it's a Kunsthalle. But when it comes to exhibition, then, uh, then out of the top 10 most visited exhibitions of the year, about three exhibitions are from Japan. Uh, so what I can say is that uh, Maezasan, who I brought to the auction market, is quite an exception. And uh, there are people who buy plus $20 million, but uh, big buyers are more in uh, China or Taiwan. And uh, Japan, there are more, what do you say? It's a mature market, buyers everywhere, but not to that level. And, but in these past two years, it's quite growing. We, yeah, 40% um, of our new clients in the recent years are under 40 years old. So it's a very young demographic. Of, in that age bracket, about 40% of their spend is on Western art. So 40 cents of every dollar goes to Western art. So we've got 40, 40, and 40. Um, and that's, that's really interesting to us. I mean, the billionaires in Asia tend to be about 20 years younger than billionaires in the West. So that's also another kind of support statistic for a, a much younger demographic. And they come from different industries. And, and again, I think it's very cultural. For example, in Korea, there's a kind of, um, it's, it's part of your family dynamic and family tree, and that's something that's passed down generation to generation. In other countries, probably Japan also, it's more, there's a lot of tech industry participation, electronics, so people in industries, but not so much the industries themselves. And in terms of the kind of art that they're interested in when you talk about Western art, it's interesting. Uh, is it modern, old masters? What do they want? Well, the interesting thing is that, you know, and trying to generalize again is so hard, but um, they like, they're kind of diversifying and broadening their interest rather than becoming more specific. So when we sell in Hong Kong, we sell 11 categories at one time. And it's not that we're not seeing a trend where a typical collector of Chinese modern art is abandoning a category and collecting contemporary. It's more like a broadening interest and diversification and growth. What about you, Uli? What are you seeing among some of the clients that you work with? Um, maybe we... Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we take a look at 
the dynamics of how collecting set in. I'm now talking. We also can't hear you. Uh, Sorry. Is it working? It oh, is. It is working. Okay. Um, if we look at the dynamics, um, I'm talking now mainly mainland China. Um, capital formation only starts in the 90s. Before, there is no collecting, neither of Chinese art nor Western art. And uh, in the 90s, the collecting was actually concentrated on mainly, mainly Western buyers. And I'm talking contemporary. And uh, you couldn't find Chinese collectors at the time. And then um, with the year 2000, 2003, I think Phil Tinari described the process, uh, uh, 2003, something like that, Chinese collectors came on the market. Before, as I said, there were years where I was the market in China. No one, no one bought. Now, then a lot of, not necessarily the young people, more established, uh, newly wealthy people, tried or bought contemporary Chinese art. They didn't touch Western art because they didn't feel comfortable. They didn't have any knowledge whatsoever, so they would remain within China. And then younger people joined the collecting community and then uh, happened what Linda has been describing. They, uh, there is a first the shift into contemporary and then towards like 2010 or later, a very strong shift to Western contemporary. And these collectors are in their majority young. They're very curious. They move fast. They don't really know the context of art, uh, but you know they may focus on artists. It's actually a feast for the big players, galleries that we see here, because you know they can educate these collectors very early on. They can lead them in a direction, and uh, these people buy without much, uh, say, study without. Uh, and they buy very passionately. So sort of an instinct. In yeah, instinct. very much so. Right. No, that, that's the new type of mainland Chinese collector. Yeah, I was asking our, our um, specialists in Asia about education and how important that was. And they said, more than ed traditional education per se, it's exposure. It's really seeing. And when you put the art in front of the collector, there's a response in that they love context. They love contextualization. For Western art, they love to know who might be a parallel Chinese artist or what the lineage might be or what other museums acquire them, but it's a different kind of learning process than we're traditionally used to when we think about arts education and educating people. But I think it is a little bit more instinctual, but it's really critical that the art is there and that they can see it and that you help them provide a context. And the investment thought is always present. It may be you know, in the forefront or maybe in the back of a mind, but it's always present because in Asia we don't have this dichotomy of you know, pure art, and here is commerce. Uh, you know, they're very freely moved between the two, and uh, that also reflects in the collecting and in their choices. Do you see that as well, Akisan, that, that it's a very much a uh, combination of both the art and commerce? Among yes, the... I see that, and uh, I think that Japan is famous for the uh, buying impressionists in the 80s, and I see two differences now. Now, for the first time, uh, Japanese young entrepreneurs have been starting to buy contemporary art, yes, like uh, others. And the other is, thing is that they used to always buy a Ginza. Japanese are more domestic than Chinese people. But uh, now, so many visit are visiting uh, Basel, Hong Kong, or uh, auctions becoming international. Lisa, you were talking about the statistics of 40% of the art that, that is being bought in, from, by Asian buyers is from the West. Are you also then hearing complaints, though, from Asian artists that they really want these investors to be paying more attention to their own, the art created by artists in their own cultures? 
Well, I think, you know, when you think about um, Art Basel Hong Kong, 50% of the gal, I guess there were 246 or seven galleries there, half of them were Western. I think for Western galleries to succeed, and I actually wanted to ask Mark Glimpscher this when he was on stage, but from what I'm hearing is they have to have a component of Asian art in their program. It can't just be Western. So I think what's interesting for them is a kind of combination. When you know, the Western art that's being bought in Asia is still very narrow. We sold 100% of the Western art in our sales, but it's, it wasn't just good luck. It was that we, it was very predictive, and we've seen patterns and trends of what kind of Western art is interested to Asians, and hence, we put those artists in our sale and also our selling exhibitions. But um, Chinese contemporary art as a category, for example, was very, very strong in the early years when I first joined Sotheby's, and those artists were always part of our evening sales in New York. And that sort of went away, and those artists became much more prevalent and predominant in sales in Asia, per se. And I'm kind of curious about the comeback of Chinese contemporary art, because it sort of vanished a little bit, but now seems to be reemerging as a strong category for Asian collectors, and then the question is, will it reemerge for Western collectors the way it was in 2010, 11, 12? What do you of think course. about that, Uli? Sorry. What do you uh, think about that? Of course, art production, art creation, and the market very intertwined. And we see, say, in China, uh, the contemporary art either trying to sort of merge with this global mainstream, and that particular Chinese contemporary art we see in the auctions, and that maybe right now makes the market. And then we see a turn to the tradition. That's another strong turn within Chinese contemporary art market, uh, how contemporary artists deal with their own tradition. Uh, of course, it's a vast resource which may allow them to produce art by difference to, say, this global mainstream. And we see these two markets, and the second market is more something for Chinese contemporary or even Chinese modern collectors. So you see you know, these two different markets. And just uh, to make a notion about Chinese collectors, not, not a value judgment. Uh, they tend to follow brands because there's still some insecurity, and they follow each other. They, unlike, say, we in Europe, where we would be proud of a collection, you know, which is different than yours and different than yours, uh, they follow each other, and it's more like having a bigger X than you have uh, than, you know, a variety of Western artists. I think this is normal in the development of an mm -hmm. emerging market, but I'm looking forward to that moment where they will follow more their own judgment, the collectors. Is there a culture of opening up private collections for viewing as a part of this sort of competitive uh, purchasing um, to I show off what you, you have and how your collection might be better than somebody else's? Acoustically, I didn't understand the first part of your sentence. Is there a, cu a culture in uh, China, let's start with, but I'm interested in other Asian markets, of opening up private collections for people to come and see them or lending uh, them to museums? Yes, yes, very strongly. We see lots of uh, private institutions you know, coming on stream, uh, which is very different from the tradition where you would have uh, your work to yourself and maybe with friends you would open a scroll and look at it and uh, there was no tendency to lend works early on because of that tradition this has totally changed now there is openness and and, and there is a desire for status or for other reasons to to show in private museums because public museums still uh, of course have uh, limitations censorship etc I think there's a vibrant scene in Southeast Asia, for example, in, in, um, in Jakarta, the new Makan Museum, Modern and Contemporary Art, that's again a blend of Western art and Asian art has opened. So I think, um, you know, these are the kind of, this is what the art world loves. And when you talk about community, it's those new destinations, going to those places and discovering art. And that's 
what the collective art world is very, very good at. We will go anywhere to see a great collection of art or to learn something about, I think, local art forms that may let, be less familiar to us. And certainly, uh, Japan, I mean, it's, if you follow Instagram, it, it, there has been more visitation, I think, of Japan, of Japan this year than I've seen in a very, very long time. And places like Naoshima, I mean, are really becoming pilgrimage sites. And I can't believe how many people have been telling me about their travels to Japan to more traditional and contemporary sites around the country. It's really like Naoshima the place to go. Naoshima has been very popular. It's quite a phenomenon, actually. Has it influenced how people collect? Well, I think, uh, actually, the influence recently is Maezawa-san. OK. Pe people are starting, you know, the person who bought the $100 million Basquiat, and people think, oh, showing off art is not wrong. <laughs> yes. So Japanese attitude has changed a bit, yes. Uh, on the flip side, you and I have talked a little bit in the past about what Japanese artists translate into the Western market, which, which artists are very popular, like Yayoi Kusama, um, Takashi Murakami, and you were talking about your curiosity about what kind of Chinese contemporary art will be of interest in the West. Is there any unifying theme of what Westerners find interesting in Asian art? I think, you know, I think again, as, as Dr. Sig said, it's, it's, it's really art that speaks about, I mean, there are two kinds of art. I think there's a growing trend toward more conceptual art, which is very interesting, and then there are the names that we all know. But I think it's really art that's more reflective of society and of um, societal changes that the West is very interested in when we look at Chinese art. What there, do you think, Louis? Uh, I think there will continue to exist these two preferences. One is for art that looks Chinese, and one is for art that comes out of China that does not look Chinese. It has to do with what I said earlier, this kind of convergence of Chinese contemporary art, which looked very different in the 80s, 90s from uh, the Western mainstream, <clears throat> because it was made by artists who who were isolated from the global art scene, who didn't have the information, who couldn't travel yet. Now all these things have changed. Now the Chinese artists also know everything. So uh, you have really these two types of, of uh, art, and both, I think, have their specific public. One may be more in the Chinese or greater Chinese space, and then the, the, the global one. What about Japanese art? What do you think is um, interesting? Is there anything that thematically unifies Japanese art that's of interest in the West? Uh, I think uh, Japanese art has quite much connection with Western art. And, uh, but recently, I think it's Gutai, as it is popular. Uh, and then it is uh, Yayoi Kusama, uh, who is very popular. and. Uh, but the next generation, I think it's uh, still sort of struggling. And uh, well, some artists are on the world stage, but. Why are they struggling? Um, I, I think it's perhaps lack of international exposure, yes. Is there not as much, in, is just Japan not considered hot anymore? The interest has moved elsewhere in Asia? No, I think they're very much interesting artists, yes. Do you have any perspective on that, Lisa? About well, I, you know, I do agree. I think that um, some of the most interesting art, that, and particularly art that's been very collectible, has been coming out of Japan. And, and the Gutai group is the perfect example, and that's been fostered by you know, something that was completely unintelligible, and then a lot of museum exhibitions universally, including a great one at the Guggenheim, started to introduce people to that. And there's a wave of artists that go from the more well-known shiragas down that continue to infiltrate and influence us. And, and certainly the phenomenon of Kusama is, is absolutely remarkable. I mean, if I look at the composition of our recent sales in Asia, there was something like 38 works by Kusama on offer from drawings to you know, much larger um, significant sculpture um, or to an early 1960s painting. And that's just 
of something that audiences can't seem to get enough of globally, universally. Um, so I think, you know, from my mind, some of the most interesting art in the last decade has been coming out of Japan and some of the most sought after, particularly in the marketplace. Personally, I'm interested in the cartoon, anime type art coming out of Japan and, uh, and to a degree South Korea. And in Asia, there is something like a consensus that this is really the future of art. Mm -hmm. In the West, we have a problem with this statement. And uh, it's, not considered art? it's not considered art yet, or when you say, what, well, what, what's it, the problem? No, not, not that it wouldn't be considered art, but not significant. We, we, we cannot imagine that it would ever take the place it does in Asia, where it's tremendously popular and, you know, eats its way into the fine arts uh, to a degree we don't know here. I, I'm curious what, what you think. Uh, about this phenomenon? I, I, well, uh, Japanese government is also encouraging manga, but I think uh, manga uh, and fine art... Oh, mm. Can you use your mic so we can hear you? Oh. Um, yes, recently uh, Japanese government had been very much encouraging manga, but I also agree that uh, I think manga and uh, fine art is a bit different, yes. We're going to go to questions in a minute, so please tee up uh, your thoughts. But uh, we've talked a lot about the sort of big markets, and you had uh, briefly, Lisa, mentioned some smaller markets that, that the great thing about the art community is that they'll go anywhere to see good art. What, what are some of the rising uh, smaller art centers in Asia? That, I probably am not the best person to, to um, address that because I, haven't, I don't travel as widely in Asia as my colleagues do, but... From what I hear is, might be Philippines. Mm -hmm. uh, Singapore is already a growing market. Uh, of course, Hong Kong, Taiwan is already a big market. Probably there are more. Uh, well, Indonesia. Are there any surprises? Indonesia. Indonesia, yes. Yeah, I think in terms of art creation, you have Indonesia, which is you know, very much alive. It may not be so much to, say, a European taste. Um, and. Uh, you have like the Philippines uh, getting very hot. But for me, there is always this question, um, are these new emerging type art scenes, are they actually endangered species and will be swallowed up by the global mainstream? You know, and these differences will disappear or can they sustain what they are right now? Very interesting, that's a provocative uh, note to Toss it off to the audience. Does anyone have a question? Uh, back here. So the next uh, market frontier is, uh, so how do you, uh, we can predict India or Islamic, uh, like art from the Arab world or the buyers from this region? Because, uh, well, if we consider Philippines, uh, Indonesia, I think that um, there is a more potential, buying potential from Indian buyers or buyers from um, the Islam, uh, Arab worlds. So the question is um, why um, India or other regions not considered as the next market frontiers or the next buying power? Is India considered the next frontier? Um, I think India is also next frontier. I, I must not be answering, but uh, Sotheby's will be holding a first auction, I think, uh, I I I this autumn. Exactly. Uh, but I think when I think of India, then it is more the overseas Indian people who have been buying. They have been very active in impressionist and uh, contemporary. A, a very small number compared to, obviously, the size of the country and, and the wealth that's being created there. But we are holding our first auction in Delhi and have um, reopened an office there. And it's, it's definitely a frontier. I've been hearing this for a while, though. And I think a large part of that has to be the fact, is reflective of the fact that it's very, I wouldn't call it provincial art, but there's a tremendous interest in local art. And it hasn't expanded to Western art as widely as it has in China and Asia, I think. 
um, when you talk about the Middle East, that's a whole different phenomenon and, and very, very separate, and that has been a very active and thriving place for a while with art fairs and much, much museum growth and something that I think is very familiar, more familiar globally than India is. But certainly, you know, there are multiple frontiers. And when we talk about even the topic of this panel of Asia as a new frontier, it's really, you know, probably a 10-year phenomenon at this point. But Aki was reminding me how when in 2005, you said, like, what was your statistic? It was incredibly small. In 2005, small. Uh, the percentage of Hong Kong auction was 8 or 9% of total Sotheby's uh, turnover, which is now 39%. Or, yeah. Exactly. Do we have any other questions? I think I see a hand way back there. Um, this is a question to Uli Sieg. Um, in our, our Basel committee meetings, we very often have one question that's always reoccurring this sense of colonialism, how much is that perceived still? How much have we dealt with it? How has that improved? I'm not sure I understood the question. Uh, could, the question of, I'm sorry, I don't think we heard the, the, the word that you used. Colonialism. colonialism. Ah, colonialism. Yeah. Uh, I assume your question uh, touches the Chinese art. Um, in today's China, colonialism is no issue. For the artists, it hasn't been an issue, except maybe some southern artists living very close or in Hong Kong, um, when it's a, like a British Chinese type tension issue. But in mainland, for long, it doesn't exist in the art creation. It may actually turn around because we see now a very uh, self-asserted China and we see how it's expanding into Africa, Latin America, uh, South China Sea. So there will be art production with some such topic, but maybe by other nations. That would be my prognosis. And maybe the question is also about acquisition, right? You're talking about production, but is there also a sort of colonial aspect to Westerners buying up certain local art? Is that, is that what you were referring to? Is that still working? Okay. No, it was the other way around. It was Western galleries coming to Asia, dominating the scene to a degree that has changed Hong Kong completely. And the perception from the Chinese and from the Asian community of how much is that a colonialism by invading uh, the art market, changing the art market, making a much more Western-oriented market, is that, is that an issue and how are we dealing with it? Now I understood the question ah. better, because acoustically not so easy here. Do you want to take it, or Lisa, um, do you want to take no, it? No, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Did no, please, understand? please, yeah. now that you understand that. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think with, with this self-assertiveness of the new China, uh, they don't see it this way. You know, they, uh, I think, are certain that they will play a similar role in the art market in not too distant future as in the world economy. So I don't see much of, of that type of uh, issue. It may be different within the art operating system. Of course, the Chinese galleries, you know, they have a concern uh, because they may not have this type of Western artist that can create where the demand is. So uh, that's on another level, but uh, I, I don't see that, you know, China feels there is uh, this issue of Western galleries imposing their art on China. The opposite movement we will see, like China is now kind of trying to expand its soft power, and it's actually very intent on promoting Chinese tradition uh, abroad. And that also means support a very specific type of contemporary art, which caters to this idea of Chinese tradition. And, you know, some artists, as we have talked about earlier, are on this line. Some may trend there for opportunistic reasons to get the support of the government. The government is quite selective what it's supporting because uh, it wants to create a certain perception of uh, China in the outside world. 
Well, I think we could probably go on on that topic, but unfortunately, we're out of time. May and I so, add just one comment? Uh, I think uh, colonialism doesn't apply. Perhaps in contemporary art, Western galleries are c coming. But when you look, Japan in the 80s pushed up the imp Impressionist price, but the Chinese have changed completely the art price structure. Ceramics never went to $10, 20000000 million. Yes. All right, well, thank you so much to our esteemed panelists. We really appreciate it, and we'll see you around. Thank you.